Welcome to Building Bridges Through Faith, a program presented on behalf of the Ismaili Jamaat Kanan Centers USA. My name is Benoush and I serve in a voluntary capacity as the member for communications and outreach on the Ismaili Council for the Southeastern United States. The Ismaili Jamaat Kanaz around the world are more than places of worship and spiritual search. These spaces hope to encourage community engagement, broaden our intellectual horizons, and foster an appreciation of pluralism. In September of 2002, His Highness, the Aga Khan, when addressing an international gathering at the conclusion of the Prince Claus Funds Conference, cautioned about the consequences of the present level of global cultural ignorance, particularly so in, the, in a number of functioning democracies where an informed public plays a critical role. He emphasized that the failure to recognize the pluralistic nature of human society was perhaps the most common ingredient of recent conflicts. He said, the attempt by communal groups, be they ethnic, religious, or tribal groups, to impose themselves on others aims to eradicate the cultural basis of group identity. Recognizing the need for the common good and love of the neighbor, the United Nations established World Interfaith Harmony Week, a week which is celebrated the first week of each February for the purpose of, of, of all people coming together, all people of goodwill, recognizing that our common values far outweigh our differences and provide a strong dosage of peace and harmony to our communities. Today, the Ismaili Jamaat Kanan Center USA in collaboration with Interfaith Atlanta are honored to have with us the founder and president of Interfaith Youth Corps, a Rhodes Scholar and an author, Dr. Ibu Patel. Dr. Patel served on President Obama's inaugural advisory council on faith-based neighborhood partnerships and is the recipient of a number of awards for his work. This segment of the program will be moderated by Rabbi Ellen Nemhauser, who is the president of Interfaith Atlanta. Welcome, Dr. Patel and Rabbi Ellen. The Ismaili Council is grateful for this collaboration. Thank you. It's a delight and an honor to be here and certainly a, a huge honor to be uh, moderating um, for Dr. Evi Patel, whom I've heard speak and uh, live here in Atlanta at one point and whose book, uh, Acts of Faith, I have certainly read. It's um, inspiring and uh, instructive and uh, and and uh, a, a must read really for all of you. So um, welcome. Thank you, Ellen. So nice to be with you. And great to be with you. Um, so I have some questions that I think uh, that I myself am curious about and I'm sure that uh, all those who are listening and participating will be um, delighted to hear your responses too. Um, I love how the book starts off with um, uh, in your uh, tribute page or your quote page at the beginning with the Rumi quote, start a huge foolish project like Noah. Uh, really all of our um, Abrahamic faiths can understand the story of Noah and it certainly was a huge project that not a lot of people believed in and I'm wondering if uh, that probably is the case for you. But let me ask um, this question. So in the book, you talk about how you um, went about establishing the Interfaith Youth Corps uh, the Chicago Youth Council and the initial struggles from where it started to where it is now. And you state, I quote, the big idea of interfaith youth core, the dream of young people building religious pluralism. Um, so my, my question is a two part question. How do you define religious pluralism? And second, why focus on youth? Um, do you kind of, have you given up on adults? They've already uh, passed that stage of uh, making great change in our world. Well, uh, Rabbi Alan, thank you so much for, for conducting this interview with me. I want to thank uh, the uh, Ismaili Council for hosting this event and uh, everybody who's participating. Uh, this is such an important topic, which is how do we build pluralism in a world that's riven by conflict and how do we encourage young people to be in the leadership of this? So 
I started IFYC when I was in my mid twenties and people often ask why we focused on young people, at least at the beginning. Uh, and I like to joke, you know, when I was in my mid twenties, the, the Pope wasn't taking my phone call. The truth is the Pope is still not taking my phone call tw 20 years later. Uh, but back then I, my network was young people in their uh, early and mid twenties. And we were inspired by our religious traditions. We were inspired by the idea of service. We were the inspired. We were inspired about the idea of building a positive pluralism and and a sense of cooperation. And so, so much of this at the beginnings for me was was how do I get uh, my my friends and colleagues and peers, my generation, involved? And and we were big, the the big idea we wanted to be involved in was pluralism. And I've got kind of a an academic definition of that. I carry the baggage of graduate school, and so you'll allow me to kind of uh, um, define it in three points. The, the definition of pluralism is a society in which people from different backgrounds have respect for each other's identities, have relationships between different communities, and have a commitment to a common life together, right? So I'll say that one more time. Uh, it's, it's a society where people from different backgrounds have respect for each other's identities, a recognition that people pray in different ways, that they speak in different languages, that they enjoy different foods, that's diversity. It's really important and the distinctive identities of diversity have to be protected and respected. But there have to be relationships. We need to, uh, um, we need to uh, work together. We need to enjoy one another. We need to appreciate one another. There have to be those relationships and we have to live together, right? If you think about a hospital, it's a place where, where healers, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, uh, they, they're coming together inspired by their different identities to heal and they're working together to save lives, to, to, to treat people, to do some really important things. And so I think to myself that young people ought to be at the center of this. I certainly have not given up on adults. And now that I'm, you know, in the fully in the swing of middle age in my mid forties and my wonderful children are 10 and 13, I see them being leaders of pluralism, but I also see, uh, uh, people of all ages being leaders. I do think one thing is, uh, is interesting to point out, which is that so many of the people that we consider heroes of pluralism began their work when they were very young. So uh, Dr. Mark Luther King Jr. is from your hometown of Atlanta. He begins his work in the Montgomery bus boycott when he's 26 years old. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi begins his work building pluralism when he's even younger. Uh, when he's in when he's in his early twenties in the race in the movement against the racist pass laws of South Africa and the Aga Khan, uh, uh, His Highness the Aga Khan, who's the leader of my faith tradition, uh, the Ismaili Tariqa of Islam, was twenty years old when he was appointed to the office of Imam. And so all of these are leaders of pluralism, and they all begin their work young. And so I think we're often dismissive of young people when actually the examples that they provide are very inspiring. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so you talk a little bit about the, um, the work of that, of those individuals. What about um, the idea that, you know, it seems that you modeled your, your um, interfaith work around, um, you know, gathering people from different faith traditions and having them work in service together. Um, can you share more about that, uh, that model, that methodology, and perhaps some examples of some programs that, uh, that those initial programs that you felt were successful in accomplishing your mission? Dr. King said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. I love that line. And I grew up in a house of service. I, I volunteered at the YMCA when I was growing up. It was very much inspired by by the Ismaili tradition, which was which was very present in my house. Uh, Ismailis have a wonderful tradition of service uh, sure. within the Jamaat Khanna and through institutions like the Aga Khan Deve Development Network. And it just became obvious to me as I grew up and I had friends from different religions that service was an important part of their lives and their faiths. And it just, it's a place to express your one's identity. You're a better Ismaili when you serve the society. And that's, that's, that is, written into our tradition. It's virtually a command. It is a wonderful way to build relationships with people from other identities. And it is, it is a concrete manifestation of our commitment to a common life together. And by the way, we all know this and we all do it. So if you go to any, any uh, a food depository, the Greater Chicago Food Depository or the Atlanta Food Depository, a place where, where people are packing boxes of food for, for people who are experiencing hunger in our society, 
uh, it's always people from diverse religious communities who are doing it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a huge part of our civil society and our social services are made up of, of faith communities in action. And, and therefore, it feels to me like, like that part of being in action and in service is a place that we should, it, we should use more deliberately towards the facilitation of positive relationships. So feeding others, what's another example perhaps? Of a Disaster person? relief. Disaster okay. relief. So of, of, uh, there's, a, there's an advisory council on disaster relief of about 75 different organizations. 40 of them are faith-based organizations. Um, uh, Habitat for Humanity uh, is a terrific example. So when Millard Fuller starts Habitat for Humanity in America's Georgia, not far from where you are right now, his idea is not just the theology of the hammer, right, which is that we express our Christian faith through serving others. It's very much an ecumenical organization. Millard Fuller was frustrated that he couldn't bring evangelical and mainline Protestants together in theological discussions. And he figured, well, I'll bring them together in service. Indeed. Right? So, so they're literally everywhere that service is performed from hospitals uh, um, to, to visits to senior centers, people from diverse religious communities are, are very well represented and they ought to be using that activity as a way to get to know each other's religious traditions and each other better. Fantastic. So some people are nervous about getting together to engage in interfa interfaith activities or interfaith um, events because I feel like it's a dilution of their own faith. So, you know, um, you know, a Jewish community or a, a Catholic community or a, um, you know, another community, an Islamic or a uh, Buddhist community might feel like if I go there or individuals, not the communities themselves, but individuals may feel if I go there, what I'm saying is, you know, I'm not strong enough in my own faith. That'll dilute what I, what I really believe because we are different. Let's be real. We're different. So how do you, how do you respond to people who have that concern and how did you get over that concern or advise people to get over that concern? So uh, in some ways, the answer is both theological and practical. In, in all of our religious traditions, there is not just an inspiration, but I think a command to, to positively cooperate with each other. Uh, in, in Christianity, for example, there's the Great Commission, which is, you know, take the gospel to all peoples. But there's also the Great Cooperation, which is you are uh, uh, you're supposed to cooperate with people from different backgrounds. And the Good Samaritan story is, is probably the, the central story of that. It is such a salient part of my own tariqa, uh, the Ismaili tariqa of Islam. Uh, His Highness the Aga Khan is speaking frequently about the importance of appreciating people from different backgrounds and working with them. So th it's, it's part of theology, right? It's part of theology, uh, but it's also just practical. Right there, there, there's there aren't that many caves on planet Earth where you can hide your children from the diversity of the world. I mean, just think about how the situation in which your kids are born, right, uh, mm -hmm. uh, delivered by you know a Jewish doctor, aided by a, a Muslim anesthesiologist in a in a room that's been sanitized by uh, by a Southern Baptist with a, a Hindu nurse present at a hospital that's started by a Catholic order that's run by uh, a, a humanist who grew up Buddhist, right? And that's every hospital in the country and it's every baby born these days. We are literally born into a situation of diversity. But here's the question. Do you have, or do your kids have the, the theological articulacy, to use a geeky term, to, to articulate their identity in a world of diversity? Mm -hmm. Right. So if we only teach our kids a language of faith that is relevant for the Jamaat Khana or the synagogue or the Gurudwara or the church, and they only spend, you know, at most four, six, eight, 10, 12 hours a week in those spaces. Right. Even if you go to Jamaat Khana every night of the week uh, um, or church every night of the week, it still only adds up to 10 hours or 12 hours. Right. right. You're spending the vast majority of your time with people from different backgrounds. And if you have no way to talk about your faith with those people, the muscle of faith atrophies. And yeah. so we actually think we are, we are offering a, a, a great gift to religious communities, which is an ability to talk about your religious tradition in a world of diversity in a way that strengthens your identity, makes mm -hmm. you more proud of it and is 
and helps you live out the theology of cooperation. So let's say one more thing here, which is, you know, what, uh, in my house, my, my uh, wonderful wife Shanaz and I were constantly highlighting examples of Muslims in the public sphere to our kids, mm -hmm. right? Muslims who are comfortable with their faith in public, comfortable mm -hmm. uh, saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, like most deaf does uh, before, um, uh, you know, the album Black on Both Sides. Uh, 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 comfortable talking about Islam like Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar are, right? We're constantly saying, listen, you're gonna live in a situation of diversity, be comfortable with how you engage with people and be proud of your identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a concern that's shared by faith leaders and, um, you know, and uh, even lay leaders. And uh, Aga Khan himself said, um, diversification without disintegration, this is the greatest challenge of our time. Um, I think you've you've kind of expounded on the the necessity to um, or the uh, the urgency to live out our faith um, and be able to articulate our faith um, connections even in this diverse world. We don't have a choice about that, as you say. Um, I myself had a baby. My my third was born in Cincinnati at the Christ Hospital, and I thought it was funny that he had a onesie that said, I'm a Christ baby, and it's Rabbi Ellen's baby, the Christ baby. <laughs> so we, this is the world, you're absolutely right. This is the world we live in. That's a great story. That's that's a great story, right? And and if you have a, a Muslim physician entering your operating room, and she says you know, a Muslim prayer before doing heart surgery on your mom, you're glad she said the Muslim I prayer. Happy. Right? <laughs> very happy. Yes. And, and I, I think hospitals are actually exceptional examples, mm -hmm. exceptional examples of a place where people from different identities come uh, and those religious identities are highly salient in that situation and they're working together in right. really positive and beautiful ways. Right, so we need to teach our children you don't have to give anything up to be part of this incredible diversity. Um, in fact, the opposite. You need to live proud and um, and share and take from the best right. of our common teachings to um, to share with others. Beautiful. I, I do think it's a matter of emphasis, though. Right. All of our all of our traditions are wide as oceans, and we choose to emphasize things at different times. And so, Absolutely. you know, there there are times when it's appropriate for an evangelical Christian to emphasize the Great Commission and to preach the gospel to people in a way that would win them over. And there's times when, when that same person would, would emphasize the great cooperation, right? If you're helping people after an earthquake, it's not the time to preach to convert. Absolutely. Uh, it's the time to be a, to be, the, to be a great Christian in a different way. Oh, I love that. Timing's timing is, is uh, essential. So tell us a little bit about um, what it was like serving on uh, the esteemed President Obama's advisory council. Uh, well, I mean, those were the days, right? Um, uh, it, it was, I mean, it was a, you know, it was a dream come true. It was a dream come true. And, and President Obama paid paid a lot of attention to the, the to that inaugural council. We met with him in the Oval Office in the first weeks of his presidency. I'll never forget when he said, uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm starting this council is to encourage service between people of different religions. I think America was built that way. And he said, I think young people ought to be in the leadership of that. And I gingerly raised my hand and I said, you know, we, we will, we will take that as a call to action, President Obama. And he kind of looked at me as if to say, you know, you better. And we actually <laughs> then ran a program with the White House called the President's Interfaith Challenge, which, which brought hundreds and hundreds of campuses and thousands and thousands Absolutely. of students together to do service. I, I'll tell one, one funny story. So we had a meeting with the president when we, when we uh, did our first report in the Roosevelt room, right? And, and this is like a Kairos moment in my life. It's a supreme moment. And, and we're all seated around the table that the cabinet sits. So I take my seat and I'm nervous and an and Obama aide comes around and taps me on the shoulder and says, you're sitting in the president's chair. I was like, how? They all look the same. And he said, no, 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 this is two centimeters higher than the other chairs. <laughs> so somehow I had uh, I had accidentally done that, but but I you know Barack Obama Barack Obama is a is a great man, and he led this country in remarkable ways. And and uh, Joe Biden is a man of great decency and and a man who will meet this moment. I'm confident of that. And Kamala Harris, I mean, how exciting is that? It's pretty amazing. 
my mom who's watching is over the moon about Vice President Harris as she should be. Thank you. Hi, mom. <laughs> All right, how about we wrap up with them? Um, with this, a little bit of um, uh, uh, you telling us, sharing with us um, about your your most recent book, um, "What Is Interfaith Leadership," um, which is you know based on civic interfaith leadership in a revert uh, again in a religiously diverse democracy. Can you explain those the terminology and um, just tell us a few um, a few words about the book? Um, what is it? And, and you know, I know short on time, but uh, what what's required to be an, an effective interfaith leader? Yes, so thank you. So the book is called Interfaith Leadership. And, and uh, the idea is that, that religious diversity is all around us. We need to have eyes to see it. And we need to have a knowledge base that, has a, that uh, um, encourages appreciation of that religious diversity. And we need to have a skill set to engage in positively. So vision, knowledge base, skill set. And uh, one of the things I would say that everyone in the audience can do is, is constantly ask yourself the question, what do I know about other religions that I admire? Is there scripture that I know that I find beautiful? Are there heroes from those traditions that I can name that inspire me? Are there people that I know in, in, in that religion that I think of as uh, exemplars of service or of character or of morality? So what do you know about a, a, another religion that, that inspires you? And so when you encounter somebody from that religion, you have positive images mm -hmm. in your mind. Uh, but we, you know, at IFYC, we think that everybody should be an interfaith leader. Everybody should have the vision, the knowledge base, and the skill set to engage religious diversity in ways that turns it into interfaith cooperation. Beautiful, hundred percent. So find that 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 part of yourself that can lead some aspect of interfaith uh, uh, cooperation and uh, and celebrate the diversity in this in this great country. So. Right. I mean, here's here's an exercise all of our audience can do. Right. I mean, imagine. Uh, God forbid a terrible disaster hits your town, right? And it is diverse religious communities that step up after the hurricane or the earthquake or the tornado to help people. If you had to coordinate that effort mm -hmm. of groups that range from atheists to Zoroastrians, how would you do it? How would you do it, right? So, and, and, and that's a very real world situation. That's the situation we find ourselves in today. So, so how if, if you imagine scenarios in which you would have to lead people from different religions in a situation in which religion really matters, how mm -hmm. would you do that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing with us uh, profound wisdom and uh, tried and true um, uh, acts that uh, have led you to this place where you are truly um, nationally and internationally and an inspiring and great leader who's done a tremendous amount of good in our world. So thank you. I'm grateful for you, Rabbi, Rabbi Alan. Thank you so much. I am um, really excited to, um, to introduce and um, hand over the baton of moderating to my friend, my good friend and colleague, Albina, who will be, um, Albina Bimani, who is the vice president of the Interfaith Atlanta, which is known as um, Faith Alliance of Metro Atlanta, and who really is a partner in the leadership of our um, of our organization and um, a, a hardworking spirit and a, a very fun person to work with. So you take it away, Alvina. Thank you so much, Rabbi Ellen, and thank you, Dr. P Patel, for sharing your depth of experience and thought on interfaith work. Today we have with us four individuals who are not only leaders in their various communities, but are active in the pursuit of interfaith engagement in the Atlanta area. Let's invite them onto the screen and engage with their experiences and practicalities of interfaith work. As we invite them on, let me share a little bit about each panelist. Our first panelist is Asila Rashid. Asila Rashid is co-founder and CEO of The Muslim Mix, a nonprofit organization which presents creative social events and environments targeted at Muslim young adults, while also fostering social justice activism and work specifically directed at changing the narrative about Muslim Americans and how they're portrayed in the media and society. As an active organizer within the interfaith community, she currently serves on the board for Inter Atlanta Interfaith Broadcasters and Interfaith Atlanta, formerly known as Faith Alliance of Metro Atlanta. 
She partners with the American Jewish Committee, serving on the steering committee to facilitate Muslim Jewish dialogues. And she regularly hosts interfaith visits to the local mosques in the Atlanta, Georgia area. She has traveled extensively throughout the United States, Europe, and the Middle East to build bridges and amplify female voices across religious, cultural, and ethnic lines. Outside of her work within faith communities and service, Asila enjoys spending time with her husband, Adrian Asim Rogers, and their three sons, Righteous, Noble, and Scholar. Welcome, Asila. Our second panelist is Gareth Young. Gareth is an author, podcast host, and speaker. His passion is challenging preconceptions and helping people transform and grow into authenticity, happiness, purpose, and sense of fulfillment without sacrificing worldly and career success. Gareth is, a very, is very active in interfaith and social justice work. A couple of years after being ordained as a Zen Buddhist priest, Gareth left formal Zen practice to co-found Red Clay Sangha, an Atlanta Buddhist community. He is, serving, he is serving as the president of Second Helpings Atlanta and has served as president of the Faith Alliance of Metro Atlanta and is a regular observer of Ramadan, the Jewish High Holidays, and other faith and interfaith events. He is engaged with a number of other interfaith and social justice organizations, serving on boards and participating in grassroots activism. Welcome, Gareth. Our third panelist, Reverend Kevin Crawford, is an ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church and is a PhD student at the University of Georgia. His work has included working with college students of all spiritual and religious traditions, to explore life's big question, encouraging everyone to grow in their own traditions, theistic and humanist, and to cultivate multi-religious and spiritual relationships out of humble approaches to our own apprehensions, distortions, and ambiguities. Kevin is married to Kristen Crawford. They both enjoy living in Lawrenceville, Georgia with their two Huskies, Howard Kibba and Kyla Dakota. Welcome, Kevin. And last but not least, you have already met Rabbi Ellen. Rabbi Ellen is the president of Interfaith Atlanta. Throughout her rabbinic career, she has participated in and led interfaith ventures, both professionally and as a volunteer. Ellen holds a degree in music from the University of Toronto and was ordained as rabbi in 1993. She manages an online program for the reform movement called Introduction to Judaism. And one weekend per month, she serves a small Jewish synagogue community in Fayetteville, Georgia. In 2017, Ellen was the first female rabbi to be inducted into the board of preachers at Morehouse College's Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel for her commitment to peace and tolerance through interfaith work. In 2019, Ellen received a certificate in diversity and inclusion from Cornell University. In her spare time, she enjoys hiking, traveling, and trying out new recipes on unsuspecting Shabbat dinner guests. Welcome, Rabbi Ellen, and thank you all for joining us today. Now, all of you have extensive experience in interfaith work. So I would like to ask, why is interfaith work important to you and your organization? In a minute or less, let me start with Asila. Sure. Hi, Albina and everyone. I'm happy to be joining you all today on this wonderful panel. Um, for me, the importance of interfaith work is, um, and really I rely on uh, what the Quran says. Um, when Allah says, God says, O oh mankind, we have made you into nations and tribes that ye may know each other not that ye may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. And so really I see this work that, the work that we talk about, this interfaith work, it's really revolutionary work. It's really sacred work. Um, I see we, the faith community, um, as guardians of this earth, this society, um, and this work, God's work, um, that has been trusted to us. Um, and I think really a lot of the issues that we see today and that we're dealing with today 
are really moral issues. And who's better you know, equipped to deal with and handle um, these issues and solving them than the people of faith? Um, and so really also just personally, um, interfaith work has been something that has been central, at least for my uh, community, um, my Islamic community, uh, being led by um, the late uh, great Imam Warfi Muhammad, who was really pioneering um, and, and almost a founding father, so to speak, of American Muslims engaged in interfaith work. That was something that was really, um, that I walk in his footsteps of a path that he really uh, set forth and charted um, here in, in America several years ago. And I really see it as he walked so that we can run. And even in this conversation that we're having today. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Gareth. Thank you. Um, so interfaith work for me is important, not just most obviously in the faith community, but it's also in the world at large. And it's the interfaith work itself and also the skills and um, practices that we develop and can bring to bear. Life becomes so much more interesting and rich with the interfaith practice and with those skills. If we are afraid to talk about our differences, which is really natural, it's just it's, if we don't know how to do it, it can become really hard. So if we're afraid to talk about our differences, if we're afraid to ask about our differences, relationships can be really shallow and it's kind of hard to create that connection. Um, and the spaces that we find as common ground can really become very bland and mushy and just not very interesting. So um, it's really important to me to allow us to uh, create spaces where we can really get to know each other and respect each other. Um, truly seeing each other uh, allows us to move to places where we can create an honor, real equity, real justice, and um, the richness, the, the full richness of the humanity within which we find ourselves. It also allows us a great opportunity to grow ourselves. And that's really, really important that we, we stay on that path of self-development. And it creates a great place to do that. Especially important right now when our times in our community are so divided. Yeah, absolutely. Engaging with our differences. Thank you so much. Uh, Kevin? Uh, it's good to be with all of y'all. Um, and what a great question. I think. Uh, I don't have anything new to say, so maybe I'll just say it in another way. But, uh, you know, for me, it, it kind of boils down to, in our tradition, as we talk about our, our autonomy or our freedom and our dependence. And that those things are relative to one another. And as we start to start to kind of collaborate across traditions, um, like it's been discussed already, we start to realize how dependent we are on one another for all the autonomy that we think we really enjoy. Uh, and so it's kind of kind of demystifying the illusion that we are utterly free within our traditions uh, and can operate without any consciousness or, or awareness of other people in their traditions and how they operate as well. And like like it's already been said that those distinctions need to be learned about and processed and explored together across traditions. So that's and I know that's already been said. The other thing that kind of arises for me, um, which again is <laughs> even spoken for is. It, reframing it is is what Coleridge calls imagination, which is the human capacity to pull together disparate worlds. And that we, as we do live in this kind of sense of autonomy within our own traditions, that we realize our dependence upon one another across traditions as well. And we start to realize that we can bridge these worlds together, not conflating them in any way, right? Like we need to respect our differences and honor them. But interfaith work has so much to do about recognizing the differences and our dependence on one another because of those differences, respecting them. And then, then we can start to bridge these worlds that can come together in our human to human relationships or human, uh, human to the world relationships as well. Right. So that's, that's kind of the two grounding points that really make sense for me in interfaith work and where I've found a sense of home and doing the work. Yeah, okay. absolutely. It's building on one of all of your uh, points, but I also like the idea of dependence on one another while respecting and honoring our differences. Absolutely. <coughs> Thank you. And Rabbi Ellen, your thoughts. You. So I could just say what they said, <laughs> but uh, no, I'll just add that I, um, you know, from growing up in, um, in, a, in a city outside of Toronto, um, where I was one of four, I think, Jewish people in a high school of 2,200. I was the first Jew that a lot of people met. And the misconceptions people had about 
you know, who we are as a people were just like astounding. And so I think that, that, um, you know, as Gareth has said, in this in this incredibly uh, challenging time that we're living in, that so much of our um, of of the problems, the social problems that we have, really have to do with um, fear of the other because we're ignorant of the other. We don't know the other, and so doing interfaith work and interracial work, which I think are sisters of, of uh, sisters or brothers of one another. Um, is, is so crucial. Proximity, um, um, you know, being proximate with one another, as Brian Stevenson says, really erases um, some of the misconceptions and the ignorance we have about one another. And so doing work together and learning about one another is, um, I think, will increasing that will decrease the, uh, certainly decrease fear and, and misgivings and, and, um, and decrease the, um, the issues, the problems that we have in, in society. But beyond that, um, we, we, you know, again, growing up in Canada, we don't call ourselves a melting pot, rather, we're, we're a mosaic. And we are a mosaic as people. And when we start to appreciate that incredible mosaic, that incredible way in which, you know, we, we enter the world and we operate in the world and we um, interact in the world in communities and with, you know, as, as larger communities, that mosaic is just, you know, telling us that this is the fabric of our lives and, uh, and we should celebrate it. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing, as Gareth said, um, you know, enjoy it. It's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. This posture of celebration allows us to acknowledge oh. our differences and, and build upon them even greater. Um, I think building and bridging our, our uh, wonderful panelists and the conversations we had with Dr. Patel, I would like to invite each of our panelists to kind of engage with him and, and ask some questions and to see how the work that you all are doing in your own communities, how can we foster this dialogue between the work of, of Dr. Patel and our own? So I'd actually like to begin with Kevin, would you like to um, kind of engage with Dr. Patel? Absolutely. Um, so my I've been in higher ed, as uh, you heard for a little bit now, and then I'm in a doc program in, in College and Student Affairs Administration is also my, that's where my question comes from. But it's it's rooted in, in a chapter, I think chapter three, Dr. Patel, that you, you've edited in this book. Um, and it's about the relationship, if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between multi-faith or interfaith work and community and social justice, and how sometimes those things get conflated, but you know, as, as you articulate are not the exact same thing. So it's, this has been so much fun. It's uh, uh, listening to all of you and I'm gonna kind of do a lightning round with these questions because our time is getting short here and I'm just mindful of that. So so Kevin, great great to connect with you. So I think, I think that, um, I think it's really interesting to note and I think that this is one of those kind of deep philosophical questions that takes us long into the night. The different religious communities will often have different definitions of justice. Right, um, and and to to ignore that or to elide that is sometimes is 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 almost the same as as, as eliding um, the fact that we have different doctrine. Right, I would I would rather, as Gareth suggested, us have robust conversations about where those disagreements are, and uh, and still have profound cooperation on the area of, of agreement. Um, uh, I think that that's actually, as Asila said earlier, that that's the Quranic call of, of coming to know one another, right? Now, I think that there are things that are objectively unjust. Racism is objectively unjust. And while I am interested in, in talking to a wide variety of people of various views and definitions of justice, I'm not buying a brownie from the KKK big sale. Right, so I think that there are lines that we draw, uh, but I have different definitions of justice than say a, a, an evangelical Christian or an Orthodox Catholic, and I'm curious about their views and I wanna learn from them. And there's plenty that I've learned from people with whom I, I disagree. Um, I wanna say one final thing, which is um, Masila uh, lifted up the name of, of uh, uh, Imam Murthy Muhammad. And I just wanna say how, how close I hold him and his example in my heart. Uh, I think he is the most important, least appreciated American leader of the last 50 years. Thank you so much. Absolutely. With that, actually, Asila, would you like to engage with your question? Sure. Um, and nice to meet you, uh, Ibu. 
Um, it's a it's a pleasure. I've heard so much about you and your your great work. And um, thank you for also um, lifting up uh, Imam Muhammad's name. Um, yeah. So my question, uh, and as you've heard in my bio, you know, I deal uh, a lot with uh, the young adults, uh, the millennials, and uh, Gen Zs, and all of that. And and so much of our lives, you know, it's it's spent um, in the social media realm and and online. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, um, as we see uh, all of the positive as well as the negative impact of social media uh, with this ability to instantly be able to share not only information, but as we've seen as in recent years and in this past administration, misinformation as well. Um, so I wanted to know how is this impacting the work of interfaith dialogue and how should we face this challenge? Thank you for that, Asila. Thank you for your ex powerful example and your and your remarkable work. So uh, you know, it's it's a we're living at at like a moment where the industrial revolution is happening along with the printing press having been invented along with the Reformation along with you know a, a, a thousand political revolutions. I mean, this is it is as remarkable a moment in human history as we've experienced in the last thousand years. And I think we just have to get we we need to teach our young people your values guide the way you interact with people physically uh, in real life and they guide how you interact with people online. So, you know, after after the Little League baseball game, no matter how fierce the competition on the baseball diamond, you shake hands and you respect your opponents in the game. And you should need to do the same thing online, however easy it is to, to shoot off in, uh, um, uh, an ugly message or to be a jerk or in however many prominent examples of there that that might be. So I think that I think that that the internet presents faith communities with a profound challenge that we have to rise to meet. But there's no going back. I mean that's obvious, right? That's obvious. Right. Thank you. Awesome. Gareth, would you like to engage with your question? Sure. So um yeah, life, th th this is wonderful, important, and uh, so, uh, many times very challenging work. It gets most fun and most challenging when it gets difficult, right? Um, so when uh, when problems start to show up, when we have barriers, uh, it's the, uh, also an opportunity for us to grow most when we encounter those and you know figure out new paths. So what would you say are some of the greatest barriers that you've encountered in this work? And how have you overcome those and maybe most importantly, what lessons have you drawn from those that can be handed down to the next generation of leaders? Now, thank you for that, Gareth. Um, and you, what a remarkable spiritual background you have and, and, uh, um, and journey you've been on. So it was fun to hear just a little bit of that in the introduction. I mean, I've kind of distilled, uh, um, I've, I've kind of distilled my thinking on this to a single line, which is diversity is not just the differences you like. Yeah. If, you, if you enter an interfaith or multicultural space, however many religious traditions might be represented or for many colors or cultures or genders or sexualities, if everybody agrees with you on the top 10 issues in American and global life, it's not a, it's not a diverse space, right? Uh, uh, expect disagreement. It, you know, when the mountain climber uh, approaches the mountain, she is not surprised. She prepared to climb the mountain. And in interfaith work, we deal with disagreement. We deal with doctrinal disagreement. We deal with disagreement on matters of justice. We deal with significant disagreement. We should just prepare for it. We should just prepare for it. Now, I wanna say again, there are some things that fall outside of the circle of civil discourse, right? So overt racism falls outside of that circle. But generally speaking, I am not looking for reasons to not talk to people. I am, I am doing my best to engage with people as widely and as generously as possible. And I think that that's uh, um, the, the remarkable poet Amanda Gorman talked to us about that. Uh, uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris talked to us about that. Now is a time to engage generously. Thank you. Absolutely, I think this really leads nicely to Rabbi Ellen's question. Yeah, um, so we live in a, in a country where we, um, you know, have this uh, mandate for separation of, uh, you know, religion and state. And yet uh, you uh, 
have served on a president's council um, of interfaith. Um, so religions and state, but um, we, we clearly are coming out of a time or we're in a time, we are definitely in a time of great deep polarization um, politically. And so where do you see the intersection of um, politics and interfaith work and politicians, their role in interfaith work? If you can uh, share with us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, and I think that because of time, I think this is probably the last question that, that, that we will have time for. And I want to thank everybody for their involvement. This has been so much fun in the Smiley Council for, for organizing this event. So, you know, let me say in, in, um, in American history, I think one of the things to note is that for all of the sins and mistakes of the European founders from 1776, there were founders earlier than that, as in 1619, but the European founders of 1776, for all of their sins and mistakes, the thing that they came closest to getting right was how do you build a religiously diverse democracy? And that is a remarkable fact, right? Because up until that point, it had not been done on a mass level at all. The, the thinking was that, that the only way you can have a nation or a society is if everybody was of the same race, ethnicity, and especially religion. And it was Franklin, Ben Franklin, and John Adams, and Alexander Hamilton, and George Washington, and and uh, uh, James Madison and that whole lot of people who had significant blind spots, who put, but, but who got this part right, coming out of the European world of religion, they put together a framework, a combination of, of separating church and state and allowing freedom of religion and recognizing there were gonna be tensions in between that, that imagined a day where a, a nation would have people from the four corners of the earth praying to God in different ways and coming together to build a country. And, and that is largely what, what, what we have built here. It's part of what the American experiment is about. And I think it's, it's our charge to kind of continue that. And I'll maybe end with, with one thing. So, you know, some, a, a fact that has gotten commented on too little is that Joe Biden is the second Catholic to hold the nation's highest office. And the deep anti-Catholicism in American history is, uh, it's, it's stunning. Like there are entire political parties devoted specifically to keeping Catholics out, the Know Nothing Party of the 1850s, which is you know, an analog to the QAnon movement of today. Uh, and, and America changed right, in part because of the framework put forth by our fathers, by our founding, European founding fathers, in part because of uh, civic movements like the National Conference for Christians and Jews, uh, America changed and it's widely more accepting of Catholics now to the point where so many of us forget about historic anti-Catholicism, right? The majority of Supreme Court justices are Catholic. I mean, the fact that a president will be Catholic and a majority of Supreme Court justices and, uh, uh, um, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. I mean, this is literally the anti-Catholics nightmare. Add in there, you know, a vice president who's a black Indian woman. And I mean, there's like generations of American racists turning over in their graves, right? America changes. We can change America. The work that all of us are doing is doing that in a positive way. And I think that that is the promise of interfaith work for now and in times to come. Absolutely. Wow. What an insightful and, and thought provoking conversation. Thank you so much to all of you for your engagement. As we know, the United Nations has proclaimed the first week of February as World Interfaith Harmony Week. And indeed, our conversation today is a celebration of this week. As we mentioned at the beginning of the program, in an address at the Prince Claus Fund Conference on Culture and Development in 2002, the Aga Khan states, Developing support for pluralism does not occur naturally in human society. It is a, com a concept which must be nurtured every day, in every forum, in large and small government and private institutions, in civil society organizations, working in the arts, culture, and public affairs, in the media, in the law, and in justice, particularly in terms of social justice. Thank you, Dr. Patel and our panelists for nurturing and cultivating these spaces for all to engage with one another and for joining us today to share your learnings and thoughts. On behalf of the Ismaili Jamatkana and Center, thank you all for joining. <laughs>